yeah yeah sorry 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 i just, just yeah. completely skipped um but yeah i mean introduction uh, has been like again i mean uh, guys i mean this is every time i hear this story like i'm always so inspired like aditya started his journey with like journalism then you know uh, taught in a school uh, in like with teach for india for like 3 years and then you know he also has a ted talk like feel free to search for aditya narayan and ted talk on youtube and uh, you will also get access to his ted talk where he uh, talks about uh, you know leadership in general and then he uh, i mean he applied for harvard went to harvard like the number one school in the whole world <laughs> and studied public policy there after that uh, there he did like amazing projects one in jordan uh, with the with a with the with the uh, government there uh, working on the education program and he has also worked with malala yousafzai i mean if i'm if the malala fund and then uh, worked in a vc uh, called drk and then also worked in africa like am- amazing amazing uh, demographics like when it comes to your work like us kenya and lebanon and then now he's working uh, to build hashel uh, at ef uh, with me uh so how did you begin your journey after school i mean as a science student it must have been pretty hard to convince your parents to pursue journalism um yeah i just put the ted talk in don't watch it now watch it afterwards <laughs> um if you watch it um yeah so i think i did science um in the 11th and 12th i was pretty good at maths and science i was quite a studious uh, kid in school i think at the end of 12th i uh, did a very useful exercise which is where i sat and wrote down what are all the things i'm good at and what are all the things i'm interested in in that i put all the small things to big things i put things like with the rubber ball i can do leg spin really well and like all sorts of things like that so small things like that but also big things one of the things i realized i was very good at was um that i was good at taking a lot of information and synthesizing it um and i realized this because you know a lot of my friends would come to me to explain things to them before the exam if we would play any complex games i would be the one that would be explaining it to people things like that so i realized i was good at seeing a lot of information and then sort of explaining it very well and the other thing i knew i wanted to do was you know i wanted to be creative and so i was very inspired by like performance arts or dance music theater i was involved in a lot of it so i wanted to like you know storytelling was like a big um, area of passion for me and journalism has both of those right journalism is essentially the ability to take a lot of information and then synthesize it in a very clear way but it's also the ability to tell a story so that's why i think when i did that strengths exercise i said i you know i want to study something i'm good at and i want to do something uh, i'm passionate about and that's why journalism after the 12th i think it was a little it was very hard actually to convince my parents um but i feel like if you're very clear about what you want to do and if you're able to explain it to them very well i think parents are willing to listen if you're also confused you don't know what you want to do then it becomes hard yeah it's very essential to have supportive parents to begin with i mean especially right after school um so what was your since like you you uh, went out for something really unconventional like people in india really don't uh, prefer to go for something uh, like teach for india and you know you went out with this big game of pursuing leadership and inculcating these leadership qualities and you of all of those you taught people like you went after teaching so how was your experience as a teacher like i mean teaching for like 3 months a uh, 3 years my bad yeah i actually taught for 2 years and then i worked with teach for india for two more okay. it's um i think teaching was an incredible experience i think it's an experience that a lot of people don't have right and i wasn't it wasn't like i was volunteering on the weekend or anything like that like i eventually i joined you know the private sector and things like that but like when i was uh, for those two years i was a full time teacher i taught i don't know how many of uh, the folks here know bombay but i taught in a uh, you know community called malbani and um, it was a very fairly under resourced school you know not a lot of uh, resources were available it was a fantastic uh, leadership experience i think the thing that i picked up the most uh, with that experience was that um, i i think developed a really strong work ethic and i think i developed a lot of discipline there because um, you know if you work at infosys or wipro if you don't go to work for one day 
that's okay right like if you have a little bit of a yeah. fever you just tell your manager hey i'm not going to come and work will go on if you're teaching a classroom of 60 kids and you are the only teacher if yeah. you don't go the next day 60 kids don't have a teacher and you know yeah. um especially in schools like the schools that i taught in there aren't a lot of like substitute teachers this that nothing so you just had to you couldn't miss class second thing is the responsibility of teaching is insane because yeah. some concepts that are obvious to us are very very hard to explain to kids so one of the concepts i had to teach was long division long division is an incredibly difficult topic to teach fourth standard kids it's uh you can teach it in a rote memorization way but to actually yeah. help people understand why do you do division the way that you do why it why do you what is that thematic process why does it happen so to help them understand it conceptually is extremely hard and yeah. so i think um if you do a bad job of especially subjects like maths then kids just get scared and it impacts the rest of their life so i think the you it almost the fear of maths can be instilled in a full classroom 60 individuals their lives can be affected if you just find a bad maths teacher that just scares yeah. you or is unable to explain things so i feel like that's why the responsibility that a teacher has is i think way more than i would have gotten in some entry level job in some other place so i developed a deep sense of i think work ethic and discipline in those years that i carry with me even today and being accountable like people rely on you and you know they are dependent on you and the way you mentioned it like you know maths is such an important subject now i realize the value and uh, when you are a kid that's when you grasp the most of any subject and you know if your base is like bad uh, because of a bad teacher i mean you're fucked for life <laughs> yeah so uh, then you uh, went to uh, like uh, you applied for harvard and you chose public policy there so what was the story behind it like choosing public policy for all the subjects yeah i think when when i looked at the education system in india um a lot of the education system a lot of kids go to government schools in fact if you look at most big sectors in india you look at healthcare you look at education you look at even banking banking's been privatized in the recent years you look at infrastructure you look at transport so much of it is run by the government right um and to the mass right so you leave sort of upper middle class and upwards the mass still sort of relies on uh, government for services and so when i saw the education system and what was working and what wasn't i started getting really interested in understanding what's happening at higher levels okay this is not happening in my classroom where is the money not coming from or if this is not happening in an adjacent government school what is happening to their budget what is the state government's budget okay if these teachers are not teaching properly how is government giving them teacher training so once you start understanding all of it you become very interested in the overall system um and so you realize that you can have a lot more of an impact in your life if you work at a systemic level because there the challenges are extremely complex some things that you can do can completely make or break a system one bad policy can ruin an entire you know um uh, you know uh, cadre of teachers and if you make something really good you can truly i think you know contribute to the country so i think i got very fascinated with the larger system and that's all that public policy is right public policy yeah. essentially just uh, you know government policy how does money flow how is policy implemented how does the legislative work how does bureaucracy work so i got really interested in in all of that and that's sort of why i chose to study public policy yeah i mean like you had a zoomed in version of like teaching like working for teach for india for four years and then you got a birds eye view on it but looking yeah. at your journey till now it seems like you know you would have chosen like to work with an ngo or a government entity maybe the us government or the indian government what made you uh, like choose to work with drk which is a vc firm yeah so great question so i think that maybe just one or two things i i i think that profit and impact can go hand in hand i think that there are ways in which you can build a business and i think that you can create impact um it has to be done extremely well i don't think all of capitalism works and we can discuss what parts of capitalism work and what parts of capitalism don't work i think if used well capitalism is a powerful tool um so with that background i think uh, the work that drk would do is drk would fund organizations both non profits as well as for profits so with non profits we would give grants and to for profits we would make an equity investment 
but we would only invest in organizations that we felt had a strong impact on society so we would invest in organizations in healthcare so we would invest in health tech we would invest in ed tech we would invest in fintech we would invest in areas that were either contributing to the economy or making the lives of people better um some examples again these are all sectors that also make the lives of people better but for instance drk wouldn't invest in a fashion brand or yeah. they wouldn't invest in a food and beverages brand or they would invest they wouldn't invest in an fmcg company because their model was different there are people that do it and that's great um so that's why i joined drk because i think you realize that um there is almost this belief that you know non profits do good and then for profits just make money i think with the vantage point that i've had of working across different sectors and across different countries i think that ultimately it comes down to leadership yeah. is you have bad people in government and in non profits as well and you have very good people in for profits as well uh, tata is a good company i think yeah, of exactly. a for profit company has done incredible work in india they take care of their employees their products are exceptionally good and so i think that um, i think what i tried to do was break that barrier and i think that's also what drk was doing so that's why drk after after howard so, so many people in the in the discord server they were talking about that they sort of want to learn more about communication skills or communicating your idea and uh, maybe articulate it in a better way so when you were in drk you must have met many founders uh, on a day, day to day basis so what are the key highlights when it comes to you know basic communication like uh, not basic but basic professional communication per se yeah i think off the top of my head some tips are one is uh, the shorter your communication the better it is people usually don't have time um so you know the shorter your communication the better it is at least in professional settings right short clear crisp sentences in emails and memos anything in a professional setting is different if you're writing a creative novel but i think in communication bullet points all of that work really well now in order to present yourself in short clear bullet points you need a lot of clarity yeah. and so i think with professional communication clarity comes when you practice your communication in your own room many times the first time you speak about an idea you're not going to communicate it in a clear and a coherent way yeah. and i feel like the best there isn't anything magical you know i think about communication it's just about practice you take any speech that you want to give or any pitch that you want to make uh, just take your phone uh, yeah. record yourself 10 times you don't even need friends if you have friends that's great record yourself yeah. 10 times the 11th time you will be much better so it's quite simple i don't think people need courses and other things like that yeah. but people don't do it right like i think the minute you yourself watch yourself on camera you'll be like this is not engaging i'm you know boring myself i'm not very clear this is not there then i think if you show it to your friends and true friends who will actually give you feedback they will tell you what parts you cannot see but they can see yeah. that don't make sense so i would say Uh, use short sentences practice a lot and maybe the third thing that i would say is uh, i mean this is a small tip i think in communication any time in your professional life if someone asks you a question and you don't know the answer to it yeah. say you don't know <laughs> yeah i i i get fall into that pit many times <laughs> i just keep on rambling something i can't never say i don't know um <laughs> uh, Yeah, so Praveen writes that I was going to ask about how to pitch our idea. This tip helps. I'm glad it helps. Um, so then you sort of uh, work for IDEO, like for I guess couple of years, uh, uh, and you were like working in Kenya as well. Uh, you told me about how it was like working with like African uh, uh, like colleagues, and given that like it's such a big change, like work with Indian colleagues, you also had like. Uh, people in back in the us and then again like african colleagues so like it was a very diverse environment i'm guessing so how does the communication change with them uh, essentially like right? it's a great question so in both the teams i worked in so in drk i was the only indian in fact for a long time i was the only non american in that team uh, then there's a few other folks from other continents that joined when i was working at ideo in my team in nairobi i was the only non african um i was uh, you know so i was always the odd man out and so the culture was very strong right um i loved working in uh, you know nairobi i would uh, the culture is fantastic uh, there are people that take uh, you know friendships very seriously at work i think my experience at least was you know and my experience is limited to 
ideal nairobi but uh, people really get to know you you also get to know them we would have our check ins on monday for the first half an hour 45 minutes people are just talking about their weekend what they did with their family what they did with their kids how that was in which is very different from uh, the american context where in the american context everybody does small talk for exactly one and a half minutes maximum 2 minutes it's just oh how's the weather weather is like this this that and yeah. then they are like okay let's get started but in nairobi at least my experience was on monday whenever i was leading a team i would just have to let the team just take everything out i would also enjoy <laughs> with them share everything but that was the thing once that was done it's not like yeah. people did not want to work or people were slacking or they were trying to waste time once yeah. that was done and you got to work everybody was extremely hard working my favorite part of i think working in nairobi and in kenya was people take their work seriously but they don't take themselves seriously <laughs> and i want that's the culture i you know akash that i also want us to maybe build at hushal is that where everybody oh, yeah. takes yeah. their work seriously but you don't take yourself seriously you are happy to crack jokes on yourself you're happy to like you know yeah. you're informal you're pretty chill but i think you know that that the discipline needs to be there where you know yeah. you're we are we're getting sort of we take, we like our work and we get work done but yeah. that's the one thing i picked up in kenya yeah very interestingly guys as they have uh, told me this story that uh, people in uh, kenya like they used to refer him by like the word chief <laughs> because, <laughs> because everybody refers to everybody as chief. it's like over here you know if again if you guys have been in bombay you uh, we say boss for everything yeah. are even if you're taking an auto you're like boss idhar chalo na ya or boss let's do that you you know in yeah. chennai it's like hey macha like let's do this yeah. all I think in Bangalore it's dude or like Bob. Like in Kenya, it's always like chief. <laughs> I think. So, uh, so for those who don't know what IDEO is, IDEO is a design firm, a design and innovation firm. In fact, they also designed this uh, mouse for Apple, if I'm not wrong. So, Steve Jobs was one of our first clients. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, like, what were the design problems that you came across while you were working in at IDEO? Um, So I worked with a bunch of clients at IDEO. So we're a product design firm. So typically, someone like a so the clients I worked with were like Unilever, Mastercard. Uh, I did a very interesting project with the World Food Program as well. Um, and so people would essentially come to us either with a product that they had already built that wasn't working, or they would come to us with an idea for a product and we would design it for them. IDEO's belief is that a great product is built at the intersection of three things. business design and technology if you think about it that makes sense right you need the technology yeah. to own the back end the front end is largely your ui ux design that's the design part of it and then of course it needs to have a viable business model you put all these three things together you've got uh, you know um, a really cool product um and so ideo would largely take up the design aspect as well as the business aspect of it so mostly yeah. tech companies that had a strong sort of uh, engineering team would come to us with a product we would design the whole thing for them hand it over yeah. to their sort of tech team and they would do it um yeah, yeah so designed a bunch across like fintech happy to talk more about projects but mostly worked on uh, uh b2c fintech uh products so so let me get you straight so you started with journalism education public policy then uh, stint at bc then you came to ideo and now you again like you know like getting all the information from everywhere you are just now working in a startup it's sort of related to education but not exactly it's more about related to career so you have just amalgamated all that you know things your all experiences into like just one thing and you know just putting it down to hushel now what is the more what are the most essential things you have realized in the past 3 uh, months of working at hushel i think um, throughout this fairly crazy journey i've only had one criteria for my next job which is is it interesting or is it the most interesting thing mm-hmm. when teaching was interesting i said i'll do teaching when uh, public policy i was obsessed with systems and governments that's what i did venture capital was a big deal so i did venture capital so i don't really uh, i don't preach that approach but i haven't thought about money and all of those things i'm just like if it's interesting do it 
my biggest learning at hushal honestly is that akash i am now fascinated with this creator economy yeah. i truly believe that the way that people approach careers are changing our parents worked in one company for 30 40 years if you know they did uh, millennials now change jobs every 2 to 4 years i think what's going to become mainstream in a few years is that people are going to have multiple jobs at the same time so you're going to have this portfolio based career approach you'll do multiple projects at the same time i don't think you're going to spend your full 3 4 5 6 years spending you know at one company i think that may become rarer than it is right now uh i think what i've realized at hushal is um there are a lot of challenges to building a startup i'm just really happy that we picked an area that we are extremely passionate about and just find super interesting yeah and so i think i have many other learnings about you know what you learn from customers why customer research is yeah, important yeah. and uh, how to deal with failure and how to deal with success and uh, you know things like that but maybe my most important learning is as long as you truly like what you're doing and that reason has to be more than paisa banana yeah um it's a great reason to do a startup i think i think many many uh, pitfall that most entrepreneurs fall into is uh, that they start out with this you know they recognize a problem and they start building on the solution and then they get so much into the solution that they forget the problem and now they are they don't they themselves don't know what they are solving for uh and that's i think where customer conversations really help to you know get them back to the problem and understand the problem even better and many uh, entrepreneurs just you know they don't do customer conversations because they feel like you know it's very time consuming and it's like each customer conversation takes like half an hour of your like time and to do like even 100 customer conversation it's like you know it's a it's a big task so how important is having customer conversations like i mean is it necessary and how to approach to customers i think you know i spoke about long division before and why it's difficult to teach right if you're trying to teach long division you cannot teach it the same way if you're teaching a second standard classroom if you're teaching someone who's seven years old you have to first explain what is the meaning of divide what does it mean to divide and before you teach them divide you have to teach them multiply before you teach them multiply you have to teach them subtract and then you have to teach them addition and you have to say that multiplication is repeated addition so you have to start from there because that's your audience if you're teaching an eighth standard class what long division is you'll do it differently if you're teaching 30 year olds long division then you do it differently so if you think you know something but if you just put that out there without thinking about the audience uh, you'll get it wrong about you know nine times out of 10 times i think it's the same thing with a product which is yeah. that you have an idea and you want to put it in the world but the world may not want it the world may want your idea but they may not want your product the way that you build it yeah. so you have to you have to know that your solution thesis is correct but how to build the product has to be done by consulting the audience and yeah. customer research is irritating for a lot of people especially for designers and coders we just want to build you know we just want to design we just want to yeah. build there is a thrill in doing it it's like you know uh, you you it's like a painter right painters paint designers design coders code yeah. like that's that's fun but if you're doing a startup unless you have a co-founder or a group of friends who are doing all the customer research even if you have them doing it in fact go do customer research there's so much that you learn it's just interesting to speak to human beings about your product don't take their feedback seriously it's not a comment on your solution it's just a comment on their own behavior and their own preferences and uh, so customer research is like super important um again not as much fun i know there's a bunch of folks that are engineers on this call but <laughs> it 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 you'd rather spend a few hours doing customer research and then build your product then build your product and then see the product fail and then go back having to like recode the whole thing again and do multiple cycles of it yeah i mean uh, that's a that's a good analogy there uh, i mean but like again product does product is not like you're build, you're doing an art it's like it's different you need to ask customers like pick up but yeah the other way around like because it would have been fun if picasso asked people before like i'm drawing this would you like this <laughs> yeah it's not art exactly um also uh, so like since we discussed no code tools uh, in the previous session and uh, 
So you are a big user of no-code tools. In fact, you introduced me to some of them as well. So what are some of the most important no-code tools uh, that have been absolutely helpful to you? Like these no-code tools are some tools that you wouldn't leave out even in the future. I'm going to say three, I think. Um, one is uh, Webflow, like what a tool. So like amazing tool. I've built a bunch of websites using um, Webflow. I can't code, by the way. I I, I learned uh, on Code Academy. I did around thirty hours of Python. That's yeah. that's it. I've done nothing after that. Um, someone had a question. I think the last time around, how much do you know? Need to know how to code. I think there are low code tools and no code tools. For low code, it's amazing. You uh, you know some of those are good if you know how to use them. Bubble and all are good examples of very powerful you know no to low code tools. Um, I think the tools that I really like, I've tried to use Softer. Softer is pretty good for building web apps. If you want to build a landing page, Webflow is insane. Um, like most tools, you got to see what is the community that's there, what's the support that's there. Webflow has a very sort of thriving community. There's a lot of templates, a lot of clones available. So I really like Webflow. Hushal's website is, of course, built on Webflow. Yeah. Um, the other tool I really like is Airtable. Uh, it's an amazing, yeah. I think, database. Um, I think it can do so many more things than like Google Sheets can. Sometimes people compare Google Sheets to Airtable, but like Airtable is, they're kind of similar because they have the same sort of row, column, cell structure, but Airtable is way more powerful. In a previous product that I built, we automated a bunch of, so, you know, when people would fill a form, we wrote an email on Airtable. Once the form was submitted, like, you know, they would get an automated email and things like that. And this is not even integrating like Zapier or anything with it. Just off Airtable, we had a bunch of automations running. Airtable super, we integrated it with Webflow. For that, you need Zapier. Um, and um, uh, maybe the third one, which is not really maybe a no-code tool, is Figma. Uh, so, you know... Um, uh, I think a no code tool is something that replaces something that was coded before. So maybe like HTML is replaced by, you know, your uh, yeah. Webflow front end. Figma doesn't replace code. So I'd call it, it a supplementary. It, it sort of gives the margin, the padding, the color and all the attributes. So it's e much easier to code there. So, exactly. Yeah. It's an amazing supplementary tool. If there is one, I think if, if a bunch of you guys are engineers interested in startup, if there is one thing you take away from this, maybe there are two things you can take away. One is learn Figma. Yeah. Superb hack. Second thing, if you can remember one more thing is in your life, if someone asks you a question and you don't know, just say, I don't know. That's it. I think if you remember <laughs> these two things, our time would have been uh, useful. So Aditya, my final question. What now and what next? I mean, now I'm just having a lot of fun, right? So I think yeah. a lot of entrepreneurship is just bringing a bunch of nice people and your friends together and building something, um, which is great. I, I mean, what more do, uh, you know, builders or designers or creative people or whatever it is want in life, right? You just want to build something cool that is meaningful, that helps people. Um, and it's just, uh, yeah, uh, it's a good product. That's what you want to do. So I'm, I'm quite sold on what we are building, where we are building it, the space we're building it in. So I'm full on entirely dedicated to it. I work well when I'm obsessed with something. And I think that's, that's where I am now. Um, maybe, uh, I, I think for a while I'll get obsessed with the creator economy. So, you know, I think maybe do something in that space um, later on. Um, otherwise, I think for now, mostly just entrepreneurship. I like to do other things like, you know, you know, I, and Akash, you know this, I want to continue to play sports and read books yeah. and like, you know, do other things. But in terms of work, I think entrepreneurship is it for, I think the short, medium and long term. Great, great, great answers there. Uh, guys, so I'm opening the floor for questions. Um, if you have any questions, shoot to Aditya. I, I think there were plenty of questions in the previous call regarding uh, investments and all that. So, how investor thinks before investing in any startup? Few things. Uh, I'm going to say that they look at about uh, four to five things before they invest. The first is they want to understand uh, what is the problem statement you're tackling? Is it a big enough problem statement? Um, so, you know, clarity on your problem. What is it that you're solving for someone, um, you know, is, is the first starting point. The second one is they want to understand your solution. 
uh, that sounds very obvious but a lot of times at drk people would have a problem but their solution would not really tackle that problem in the most efficient way so your solution has to be a very clear clean solution that solves the problem the third thing i think people like to see is generally is your solution innovative if you're doing something that a lot of other people are doing it means you have a lot of competitors it's a you know if you're building a me too kind of product uh, something has to be innovative about the way that you're approaching it i'd say that the fourth thing people look at is uh, um, you know your um, business model is there a business to be built here again i think that people that are starting amazing there's a huge movement of people starting tech non profits you know so the legal status is a non profit yeah. uh, but they raise millions of dollars in funding via philanthropy and you know use tech to scale it so again uh, your business model one way or another has to make sense and so that's the maybe fourth one and the final and sometimes the most important one when you're actually starting out is the team who are you what are your beliefs what are your skill sets what is your attitude towards entrepreneurship you know um, uh, things like that uh, will some investor invest to destroy our business and how can we identify them uh would they invest to destroy your business maybe because they've invested in a similar company yeah. um and so therefore they want to like destroy you i'm curious to hear sort of where uh, that question comes from um i think that happens if at all it happens mostly in like less than 0.1% of the cases yeah. i think most people are uh, good actors in the eco when i say actors i mean good stakeholders in the ecosystem Yeah. they want to invest so that i think the incentives are very aligned they invest money so that they make money um of your success and so uh, i mean there are evil people everywhere right like yeah. uh, you know what are the chances of you getting kidnapped in a taxi <laughs> not will will someone kidnap you in a taxi yeah there are some chances of it i think it's the same thing maybe slightly yeah. higher with investors just because how cutthroat and competitive the environment is yeah. but um, yeah i mean if you tell me more about that i can give you more insights but like it sounds like that super pumped uh, uh, thing like that happened with uber's founder in on a, in his first business travis kalnick i think it's i think the investor basically ripped him off completely i think he sued him for the funding he like he raised from someone else although he had promised that he would be raising with this guy but this guy didn't give him the money so he raised with someone else and then that yeah. uh, vc sued travis i mean travis is a problematic character so i don't know who was <laughs> particularly there's a dm that's come to me which is from uh, krutarth uh, which is how come you joined harvard please explain to me i identified that i wanted to actually join harvard when i was around uh, 19 or 20 i wasn't good enough to join then but i knew that i think and i believe this i think most people bill gates has a quote where he says most people overestimate what they can do in one year and underestimate what they can do in 10 years um i figured that you know when i was 20 if i had to and i went to a very regular undergraduate college i went to symbiosis international university in like pune but i figured that if i made a five year plan um and stuck to it uh with complete focus i would be able to get there when people apply to the us they apply to around 5 6 7 universities they use a consultant uh they use their gre scores of course right because you've given it you can use it in multiple universities they hedge their bets i only applied to one university i only applied to harvard um i knew way more about that university than i knew about other universities it's a different story sort of why i applied there um i figured out i think ultimately uh, you realize what they are looking for i think if you give yourself 5 years that's a lot of time to maneuver your own mindset personality skills to meet it um so i did my best ultimately it also comes down to luck right um, they pick around 220 people thousands of people apply um if there were you know better people that applied that year than me i wouldn't have gotten in i was also lucky that you know i made it through that 220 um so i'm i'm sure there were thousands of people smarter than me i'm just happy they didn't apply that year but um yeah and and then i know what the process is so you you give your gre you figure out what the recommendation letters uh, you know require you figure out what they look for in their essays you figure out what is the culture what's the ethos of harvard harvard looks for things very differently from what stanford looks for versus what columbia or kellogg or uh, whatin look for so you understand it's again same thing that we've been discussing right like i was trying to teach long division to harvard 
and so you just need to understand what they are looking for so if you spend 5 years understanding the audience then yeah. you can tailor your communication for them i i get it i think we should st- start studying our investors as well krutat <laughs> <laughs> i think you've continued your first year btech can i get into harvard for ai with scholarship uh again depends on how at a high level it depends on how committed you are how willing to work hard um people will help you i'm happy to help you um i don't know what their course is i don't know which course you're specifically talking about harvard has nine schools um they've got a engineering school as well i of course went to the public policy school um there's a med school and you know there's a law school and things like that and so you'll have to figure out what course what program who is running it what is their average age of acceptance so you know people that get in are they 25 26 27 so how many years you have to prepare before it uh, reach out to people that have gone to that program and backtrack from there uh, i think that you'll have a pretty decent chance of it you'll have maybe a 50% shot at it if you work really hard over the next 5 6 years to get in it's never going to be 100% because a lot of this comes down to luck but uh, yeah you could get in scholarship is extremely hard to get i didn't get a scholarship um i i i got some sort of a fellowship and things like that so the college did sort of help me but um yeah i think scholarship is you have to are you going to be the if you if you can work hard to be one of the top 10 people in ai over the next 6 years then i think harvard will come and call you themselves so that should be your goal um we will take a last question here because we are short of time uh, so what about investors rage how can a founder overcome it again i think depends on a case to case basis right i think uh, uh, sahit i don't know what experience you've had with investors uh, you know will they destroy them what about their rage i think i can tell you having worked in the space that some of these stories that you hear and you know uh, some of the stuff that maybe is there in tv shows and in movies um is limited it's less than 1% uh, not a lot of people do it there's a lot of very good stakeholders and good folks in vc that truly want founders and young people like you to succeed um again it's hard for me to answer this if i don't understand what have you done for the investor to get angry is it your fault are you travis or you know are you uh, someone on the investor side of the spectrum that's uh, you know just uh, for some reason wants to watch the world burn um i think one thing maybe i'll say is when you raise money um, it's very important that you identify the right investors to get on your cap table um a lot of people may not align with your own visions and dreams so before you get anyone whenever you start up sahit um before you get people on your board before you accept pe- money from people do your own diligence on them they will do diligence on you and your company but you must also do diligence on them and see if this is the kind of person i want to help me build my company and if they not say no to their money it will save you a lot of headache later great that brings us to the end of this session thank you aditya for joining us today and amazing story and guys do watch his uh, ted uh, ted talk uh, the, if you haven't copied the link do copy it like it's on the is the second message in the in the chat box also uh, like copying this uh, 